J. Deacon, reading the Supreme Court of the United States opinion syllabus in Jennings v. Rodriguez, certiorari to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Argued November 30th, 2016. Re-argued October 3rd, 2017. Decided February 27th, 2018. Immigration officials are authorized to detain certain aliens in the course of immigration proceedings while they determine whether those aliens may be lawfully present in the country. For example, 1225B of Title VIII of the U.S. Code authorizes the detention of certain aliens seeking to enter the country. Section 1225B1 applies to aliens initially determined to be inadmissible due to fraud, misrepresentation, or lack of valid documentation and to certain other aliens designated by the Attorney General in his discretion. Section 1225b2 is a catch-all provision that applies to most other applicants for admission, not covered by 1225b1. Under 1225b1, aliens are normally ordered removed without further hearing or review. 1225b1a1 But an alien indicating either an intention to apply for asylum or a credible fear of persecution, 1225b1a2, shall be determined while that alien's asylum application is pending, 1225b1b2. Aliens covered by 1225b2, in turn, shall be detained for a removal proceeding. If an immigration officer determines that they are not clearly and beyond a doubt entitled to admission, 1225b2a. The government is also authorized to detain certain aliens already in the country. Section 1226a's default rule permits the Attorney General to issue warrants for the arrest and detention of these aliens pending the outcome of their removal proceedings. The Attorney General may release these aliens on bond, except as provided in subsection c of this section. Section 1226c in turn states that the Attorney General shall take into custody any alien who fails, falls into one of the enumerated categories involving criminal offenses and terrorist activities, 1226C1, and specifies that the Attorney General may release one of those aliens only if the Attorney General decides both that doing so is necessary for witness protection purposes and that the alien will not pose a danger or a flight risk. That's 1226C2. After a 2004 conviction, respondent Alejandro Rodriguez, a Mexican citizen and lawful permanent resident of the United States, was detained pursuant to 1226, while the government sought to remove him. In May 2007, while still litigating his removal, Rodriguez filed a habeas petition, claiming that he was entitled to a bond hearing to determine whether his continued detention was justified. As relevant here, he and the class of aliens he represents allege that 1225b, 1226a, and 1226c do not authorize prolonged detention in the absence of an individual bond hearing, at which the government proves, by a clear and convincing evidence, that detention remains justified. The district court ordered a permanent injunction, and the Ninth Circuit affirmed, relying on the canon of constitutional avoidance. The Ninth Circuit constructed 1225B and 1226C as imposing an implicit six-month time limit on an alien's detention under those sections. After that point, the court held the government may continue to detain the alien only under the authority of 1226A. The court then construed 1226A to mean that an alien must be given a bond hearing every six months, and that detention beyond the initial six-month period is permitted only if the government provides by clear and convincing evidence that further detention is justified. The Supreme Court held, the judgment is reversed and the case is remanded. Justice Alito delivered the opinion of the court. Except as to Part 2, concluding that 1225B, 1226A, and 1226C do not give detained aliens the right to periodic bond hearings during the course of their detention. The Ninth Circuit misapplied the canon of constitutional avoidance in holding otherwise.
The canon of constitutional avoidance comes into play only when, after application of ordinary textual analysis, the statute is found to be susceptible to more than one plausible construction. Clark v. Martinez The Ninth Circuit's interpretations of the provisions at issue, however, are implausible. Read most naturally, 1225b1 and b2 mandate detention of applicants for admission until certain proceedings have concluded. Until that point, nothing in the statutory text imposes a limit on the length of detention, and neither provision says anything about bond hearings. Nothing in the text of 1225b1 or 1225b2 hints that those provisions have an implicit six-month time limit on the length of detention. Respondents must show that this is a plausible reading in order to prevail under the canon of constitutional avoidance, but they simply invoke the canon without making any attempt to defend their reading. The Ninth Circuit also all but ignored statutory text Zadue Das v. Davis as authority for grafting a time limit into 1225b's text. There, this court invoked the constitutional avoidance canon, construing 1231a6, which provides that an alien subject to a removal order may be detained beyond the section's 90-day removal period, to mean that the alien may not be detained beyond a period reasonably necessary to secure removal. At 699, presumptively six months at 701, the court detected ambiguity in the statutory phrase may be detained and noted the absence of any explicit statutory limit on the length of permissible detention following the entry of an order of removal. Several material differences distinguish the provisions at issue in this case from Zadjuidus interpretation of 1231A6. To start, the provisions here, unlike 1231A6, mandate detention for a specified period of time. Until immigration officers have finished considering the asylum application, 1225B1B2, or until removal proceedings have concluded, 1225B2A, section 1231A6 also uses the ambiguous may, while 1225B1 and B2 use the unequivocal mandate shall be detained. There is also a specific provision authorizing temporary parole from 1225B detention for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit, 1182D5A, but no similar release provision applies to 1231A6. That express exception implies that there are no other circumstances under which the aliens detained under 1225B may be released. Respondents also claim that the term for in 1225b1 and b2 mandates detention only until the start of applicable proceedings. That is inconsistent with the meaning of for, during or throughout, reference Oxford English Dictionary, and with the object or purpose of. That makes sense in the context of the statutory scheme as a whole nor does respondents' reading align with the historical use of four in 1225. Section 1226C's language is even clearer. By allowing aliens to be released only if the Attorney General decides that certain conditions are met, that provision reinforces the conclusion that aliens detained under its authority are not entitled to be released under any circumstance other than those expressly recognized by the statute. Together with 1226A, 1226C makes clear that the detention of aliens within its scope must continue pending a decision on removal. Section 1226C is thus not silent to the length of detention. See Demore v. Kim. The provision, by expressly stating that the covered alien may be released only if certain conditions are met, also unequivocally imposes an affirmative prohibition on releasing them under any other conditions. Finally, because 1226C and the Patriot Act apply to different categories of aliens in different ways, adopting 1226C's plain meaning 
will not make any part of the Patriot Act superfluous. Nothing in 1226A, which authorizes the Attorney General to arrest and detain an alien pending decision on removal, and which permits the Attorney General to release the alien on bond, supports the imposition of periodic bond hearings every six months, in which the Attorney General must prove by clear and convincing evidence that continued detention is necessary. Nor does it hint that the length of detention prior to the bond hearing must be considered in determining whether an alien should be released. The Ninth Circuit should consider the merits of respondents' constitutional arguments in the first instance, but before doing so, it should also re-examine whether respondents can continue litigating their claims as a class. Justice Alito delivered the opinion of the court, except to Part 2. Justice Roberts and Kennedy joined that opinion in full. Justice Thomas and Gorsuch joined as to all but Part 2. And Justice Sotomayor joined as to Part 3C. Justice Thomas filed an opinion concurring in part and concurring in the judgment, in which Justice Gorsuch joined, except for footnote 6. Breyer, Justice Breyer filed a dissenting opinion in which Justice Ginsburg and Sotomayor joined. Justice Kagan took no part in the decision of this case. Thank you.